Hello and welcome to Point and Shoot. I'm your host, Susan Hagstrom, and today I'm very happy to be joined by my guest, Skylar Thaxter. Skylar is a local photographer as well as a local media specialist. He's probably a familiar face to anyone who's ever been through Hingham High School. So uh, welcome to our show, Skylar. Thanks, Susan. It's great uh, to be here. Today we're going to be uh, talking to Skylar about his photography, his long career here in Hingham. And uh, we'll just start by asking you what first got you interested in photography and the media arts. Well, a long time ago, <laughs> since I'm retired, in the 70s, uh, I took a course uh, to, uh, in uh, preparation of instructional materials uh, during the summer to get recertified for teaching. And I also took a course in black and white photography. Hmm. And from that point, after I went in the dark room and saw images coming up, I just sort of got the bug and right. did a lot of black and white photography for years. Okay. And... Uh, and a lot of slides too. Okay, so you caught the shutterbug as they say. Uh, now, how did your career begin in the school system here in Hingham? Well, I, I went uh, back to graduate school in, uh, in library media, they called it instructional media in those days, and got a degree from Utah State, um, and uh, was able to get a job in Situate. I interviewed in Situate in Hingham. Uh, later on, I uh, got riffed from Situate and went into uh, multi-image production for a few years until another job opened up, which was in Hingham okay. at Plymouth River School as their library media specialist. Okay. And then uh, how long were you there before you made the transition up I to high school? I think I was school? there at six years. Oh, and, wow. And then uh, in 1991, probably as a result of downsizing, um, I took over two people's position, oh. and I ran the library at the high school and handled all the audiovisual uh, end of things as well. Okay. Um, and had a person there one day a week plus an aide, I think. Okay. Now, I know technology has changed so much since you probably stress. first started there, and you just had to deal with whatever changes were thrown at you. I know you... Um, had a huge impact on so many students there. Um, I just heard so many, you know, and, and kids, it's a great age for kids to get involved in media arts because they're not inhibited like we grown-ups are. Right. They have great ideas and they are willing to take chances and do all kinds of things. And I think one of the biggest compliments I could give you is that you let them just discover themselves. So um, what kinds of classes were you teaching there? Well, so I was running the library, but this was before the new library was built in 2000. Okay. And I was teaching uh, some, a media course, which was mm -hmm. sort of a mix of, of, uh, of video and photography. We had a dark room near the science room. Okay. And I made the kids do an exhibit once a year at the town library. Okay. Um, and then in 2000, um, as director of library media, I got involved in designing the new library for the high school, and we had a, designed a TV studio, so right. things sort of shifted. Graphic arts took photography, and I ended up doing the uh, video end of things, Okay. and uh, starting out with a, a morning show and then going to the famous Friday, Friday show. show. Right, so that was that began under your tenure there? Y yes, that was one of my accomplishments. <laughs> that I, I was <laughs> about to years jumping the gun, but yes. And so I know, I mean, I saw the Friday show. I mean, anyone who's had a, a right. student go through there probably has seen it. And of course, the students are all familiar with it. Um, what would you say, how long did you end up um, staying there at the high school? Well, I was there from 90... Uh, one till 2007. So oh, so quite a while. number of years. Yeah. And, and the Friday and show from two for seven years, I did that. Okay. And so when you left, what would you say, in addition to, of course, having this influence, wonderful influence on so many yes, students, know. you know, what, what would you say, what would you list as your accomplishments there? Well, Obviously, I, you brought a lot of wonderful technology to the school. Yes. And, and, and in those days, uh, I also had to get into the internet and and I was on the computer uh, committee or the technology committee, so we wrote a technology plan oh, to, wow. you know, acquire. So I was on the technology committee, plus, you know, having the TV studio and teaching, which I loved. I loved teaching with the students and getting that whole new library going and integrated in the high school, I think, were really some of the big accomplishments, plus 
I hear from some of my students today, and right. they work for CNN or oh, wow. Channel 7 or something, so that's exciting. That's, yeah, that's great. Um, now, I know we're in the same camera club to, together, yeah, right. so I see many of your wonderful photos. Oh, what are you into as far as photography now? I mean, you're, you're retired, so uh, it's more or less a hobby? It's, yeah, well, it's always been a hobby. Okay. It's sort of those things I did during the summertime. Okay. You know, I, I do, uh, I had a show at the library last right. year to sort of get myself out there. I do sell sort of privately or at the place I go to in Maine. And um, since, uh, since then I've been, you know, out taking photographs, been involved in a book project. Okay. And... Yeah, I know you brought, brought your book. Let's take a look at it. So what can you tell us about well, this? So, so th this is a book that uh, took like five years to get uh, published. And um, it was called The Architecture of Cushing's Island, where I go every summer. You'll see a lot of my photographs are from there. And where is that? It's in Portland, Maine, and Casco Bay. Okay. And it uh, took five years to get written. Uh, my job was to find old photographs in people's scrapbooks and photograph them with a macro lens and oh, lights. Oh, okay. And also to photograph every single house as it was today. Oh, wow. Now, I don't do architectural photography, but, I mean, I had the opportunity to go out when the light was right. Okay. Or And also, I had to shoot in color and convert them to black and white and then give them to the printer as tips. Right. So you must have learned a I lot did. about. I learned a lot about <laughs> that you don't take a picture of a house on a beautiful blue sky day. Exactly. Because it black and white, it turns to gray. Right. Now we talked about your photography. Do you print? Do you print your own? Do you make yes. your own prints? I do all my own prints. Um, I've been doing that for quite a while. I have an old Epson uh, twenty two hundred, which still works great, uh, that I print all my photographs on, and I, I do my own matting and some framing yeah. because it's just cheaper right and as you know unless you're a famous photographer <laughs> but photographs don't sell for a lot of money exactly so, so if you, you put try to keep your costs into it you try to right sell so them with for 125 printing your own and then framing your own we're gonna we're gonna see a little framing demonstration yeah. a little later in the show but um printing there's a lot to know about printing that could be a hobby in and of itself it's a, right. it's a huge uh, i try to you know take photographs as i see them in the right light and and only print those ones that you know actually look good i don't do a lot of altering okay. i do use uh have been using photoshop to you know use the histogram and curves to adjust you know the high and the lows okay um and um then i just <laughs> Print them on a certain certain papers and yeah. get different results. And, and a lot of it's experimenting, right? Yeah, yeah. It is. It is. So we've, we'll get into your gear since you told us now about your printer, and in uh, later in the show we're going to look at some framing tools. But oh, we like to talk about photographers' gear. Though everyone who's into photography is into all all kinds of gadgets. So what what do you use for your camera and lenses that you really like? So um, well, I started. Uh, it was originally with film cameras, obviously, oh, Nikon, right. Olympus, then Nikon. And uh, my first digital camera was a Fuji Finepix, and uh, I left that out in the rain. So oh, I no. <laughs> then went and bought a Nikon D90 because, because I had all the lenses that were complementary to it. Okay. So I use a variety of Nikon lenses from a very wide angle to 20, you know, like a 12 to 28. And... Um, then a 28 to 130, okay, and then a, a 75 to 300, and I also have a macro lens. I, I believe it's a 75 or a 50, and I use that to do a lot of photographs. So you'll see later of of, of flowers and close-ups. Okay, things. good. So obviously the lens that you choose depends on your subject. Right. Um, uh, we're going to take a closer look at your subjects, but what would you say? And and obviously we've seen, you know, we're going to see some some closer shots from the book that uh, are landscapes, but um, what are your favorite uh, subjects to photograph? Well, I always, uh, I always loved when I got out and get up early in the morning, I, you know, go out and just photograph nature. I photographed, I've been going to this island, Cushing's Island, for 60 some years. And so it always was a natural place for me to take photographs. And as one photography teacher at Maine Photographic Workshop said, you got to take more than beautiful pictures. Right. So I started getting more abstract. Oh, okay. You know, since I spend most of the summer there, it's sort of a natural place for me to get out 
or to go into the Portland waterfront and right. photograph things. I've never really been big on doing portraits. Okay. I have done portraits. I have done a few weddings. Um, I, I admire anybody that does weddings. Yeah. It's way too much pressure. It's, tough. it's a whole other animal, right? Yeah. Well, uh, that's very interesting. When we, uh, We're going to take a quick break. And then when we come back, we're going to take a closer look at Sky's images and uh, have a little talk about how he made those images. So stay tuned. Welcome back to Point and Shoot. I'm Susan Hagstrom, your host. And we're here today talking to local photographer and very well-known teacher at Hingham High School, Skylar Thaxter. Thanks again for joining us. You're We've learned a little bit about how, how you started in photography, learned a little bit about the subjects that you like to take, and now we're going to take a little closer look at some of your work. So now you've talked about uh, landscape, ski, seascape ski shooting, skates. that's tough to say, yep. uh, out in Maine, and is this one of yeah, those this examples? This one of those from the back of the island. Uh, obviously the original was a black and white uh, negative that I converted to uh, uh, in the computer so I could print it. Um, and I do t typically see a lot of seascapes and, okay. and because this is the place I spend my entire summer. Exactly. And so I go out during storms, etc., to try to capture it. But in addition to some of the beautiful pictures, I try to uh, focus on some more abstract things like tide pools. I have a whole bunch of photos that I've taken of tide pools. Wow. This one I particularly like. You yeah. know, real wide angle lens okay. getting low. You know, and getting the reflection of the water just correct. Um, I also take a lot of rock pictures and try to get different angles and different because Maine is of of course the rocky coast, right? And so you end up and there. Uh, you're really seeing a lot of texture. Yeah, and color. In addition to that, there are uh, a lot of gardens on the island, or. My wife has a lot of gardens, so okay. as a result, I take a lot of pictures. Um, uh, Beautiful colors the there. Beautiful yeah. colors there. The, of course, the contrasting purple and green, really yeah. nice juxtaposition. And the, and the butterfly just happened to capture right and, and cropped it and uh, turned it into a print. That looks so sharp to me. Uh, that's really... Macro lens, I don't think, I don't know. I use macro lens for this picture. Okay. Um, to get the beautiful water and stuff early in the morning and, uh, you know, just got the right uh, soft focus. Mm -hmm. And this is, a, my wife has a lot of iris, so iris are something I photograph as well as uh, orange lilies and various other types. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, we go down to this place in South Carolina every year called Hunting Beach. And over the years, that the island is a barrier island, and houses have all disappeared. And so this is sort of called reaching out for help. Mm. Um, it's sort of what's left of, of what was a, a landscape. Right there, too, where this was taken early in the morning. Uh, this is just the seagrass there. I took a whole bunch of pictures of snow fences, etc. Yeah, it has a lot of fluidity to it, yeah. that shot. And World's End is a favorite spot oh, okay. to take pictures. And this was a, a foggy day at World's End. A man was up there talking to himself. And <laughs> uh, I sold a couple of these pictures. Wow. So people should know, too, that's a real moody effect that you can yeah. get. You don't always have to go out when it's bright uh, blue sky and puffy clouds. Right, but you've got to capture sometimes the moment. This uh, guy was standing out there, and, and the wave just came up. Wow. Like three quick shots <laughs> and got this one. In addition to that, we travel to Scotland. I have a lot of different pictures of Scotland. This is one of the ones I like better. That's a little more artistic. Mm -hmm. That uh, I put it submitted to the. In addition, I just got back from Tuscany in September, and I did a whole. I'm going to do a whole series on Tuscany doors, a poster. Okay. And here's a picture of Tuscany. Obviously. Wow. So that's great. You have that leading line that we talk a lot about on the show, composing yeah. your pictures bringing you into the picture and then leading you out. Yeah, as this does too. This was a church with a burned out with an empty roof. And uh, uh, we went inside it and uh, someone said, well, lie down and look up at the <laughs> ceiling. There's a cross there. And so I did. <laughs> My wife took this picture and uh, I got stung by a, oh, a hornet, but it was okay. <laughs> 
She did, she did a good job there, she, too. Oh, yeah, she, she's an artist. She's an artist. <laughs> well, that's really interesting. Thank you. you. We could really see a wide range of, even though you say, uh, even if, for someone who doesn't do portraits, that was a wide range between the flowers and the textures of the seascapes and then, of course, the uh, architecture of the places that you've traveled to. So, yeah. very well, interesting. I, I've read a lot of books along the line. And, okay. And, you know, to get the composition down as well as taking courses up at Maine Photographic Workshop yeah. and, and, you know, sort of tried to teach myself. And then the camera club is great of for course, that. Of course, yes. There's always something to learn. Yeah, you just seeing how other people see stuff is just amazing. That's for sure. Well, thank you. I enjoyed that. And uh, we talked about Sky does his own capturing of the image and then printing the image and then finally framing the image. So kind of a soup to nuts process. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to join Sky in his home studio, and he's going to give us a framing demonstration. So stay tuned and come back. Hello. Welcome back to Point and Shoot. I'm Susan Hagstrom, your host, and I'm here with Sky Thaxter, local photographer and media arts specialist. We've been talking to him. We uh, heard in the studio a little bit about how he got a start in photography, a couple projects he's working on, and then we saw some of his images. And now we're at Sky's sort of home uh, workspace, studio. yes, home <laughs> studio, and we're going to get a great demonstration on how to do some of your own framing. All photographers know that framing is really expensive. Um, after you start making all these prints and you have them sitting around, you say, what am I going to do with them? Well, once you get them framed, you could hang them, use them for yourself. You could try to sell them. You could give them away as gifts. Right. So, uh, but of course, once you start doing that, you find out that framing is really expensive. So if you can do your own framing, you can save some money. Lots of and money. you can yeah. also um, be a little creative with you know, framing right. is, a, is a whole other exactly. hobby, so you can uh, be creative with, uh, with what you do. So we're going to learn, we're going to get a demonstration. I want to find out um, what are the basic things, we're going to see them in your demonstration, but if you can just list the things that you absolutely would need to okay. start well, to do your own framing. To do your own framing, you obviously need a, a good print. Um, then you need uh, foam core. Okay. And you need your mat board. And then you need some adhesive to adhere the print to the foam core. Then you need a mat cutter. And uh, then you need to buy your finished frame to put it all in. Okay. And uh, I know there's a few different types of glass you yeah, can get. Right. Uh, UV is basically the best in terms of keeping your print from fading. Believe okay. it or not, even, even good prints fade eventually. Okay. We'll give a little bit more information later in the show about where you can get some framing supplies. But right now, I'm going to step aside and let Sky take over and uh, give us a demonstration of how to frame a print. So this is where the magic starts. You edit your photo on the computer using Lightroom or Photoshop, and then you print it on a high quality printer. I happen to use an Epson printer. Uh, with about seven or eight ink cartridges. And I always print, like to print on Epson papers. Although you have different choices here, you can print on, uh, you know, luster, you can print on Ilford paper, and uh, I have all different sizes of paper I can print on. Uh, in the end, what you're going to come out with, hopefully, is a print that might be glossy, on glossy paper, might be on semi-gloss or luster or a flat or matte paper. Um, so once you get your print, we're going to take that print over now and mount it onto foam core. So let's go there. Okay, so next we're going to figure out a couple of things. A, what is the final size of our mat or frame going to be? So we're going to take our print, whether it's this size print or that size print, you need to figure out how much mat space do you want around the edge? So what I typically do here is I take the ruler and I like to use a, a typical size like 16 by 20, 11 by 14 um, because it's cheaper to buy frames, cheaper to buy mat board, etc. So this one we're going to probably end up with a 16 by 20 frame. And so I look at the print and it's like 14 inches by nine and a half, which will basically give us a three inch space around the picture or the, what the mat will be. 
So what I need to do then is I need to adhere an adhesive to the back of the mat. Now what I do is I use a material called Scotch 568 Positionable Mountable Material. Now what this does is it has an adhesive here and you can peel it off once you mount it to the back of the picture. To save a little time, I've already mounted a piece of that to the back of the picture as we can see here. And what I've done is I've also figured out exactly where I needed to put it on the mat board. Um, in this case, I'm using a piece of 16 by 20 mat board and so I know exactly where I want to put it. So I've sort of measured that exactly so I can lay it down there. So I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to peel this off. Now I've already used uh, something to adhere it to the back and now we're going to show you how that's done on this side. So we just lay it down right along my lines that I've drawn. So I know I'm going to end up with the, it centered on the mat board. And then what I'm going to do is take this material that will protect the picture and I'm going to use this here to press down and make sure it sticks. And I'm going to start from the center of the picture out towards the edges. Now remember I said that the final size on this one is going to be 16 by 20. Um, then what we need to do is figure out are we going to, what color size mat are we going to use. So what I've done is cut some L's um, and this is, happens to be white so I can put these around and see what they look like. If I wanted to add a color, I have various colors here from black to brown to gray um, that I could put underneath to get an idea of what it would look like. Um, if I was going to put a double mat around this, I'd probably use a piece of gray. Um, and I can put that on and see what it looks like and said, yes, that would work. So then what I would do is have two pieces of 16 by 20 mat board that I need to measure out. In this case, just to demonstrate with a single mat, we're going to show you how we do the mat board. So we cut a piece of 16 by 20 mat board. As I said, we're going to have a three inch all the way around except at the bottom where you always want more. Now I've done this on a little piece of paper to figure it out. I took 16 by 20 and subtracted our 9 and a half and 14 and came up with three, three and a half on the top and bottom and then three on each side. So then what I do is I take that and I measure on the mat board where I'm going to cut the mat because those mat, where we cut the mat needs to be exact. So I'm going to trace that out, get the lines measured exactly and then I'm going to go over to our mat cutter and cut the mat that's going to go on the picture. So there, now we're going to go over to the mat cutter and use the mat cutter to cut the mat. Okay, we've got our mat board here that we've measured out with the three inches around and with three or and a half at the bottom or whatever. And this is a professional mat cutter. It's made by Logan. Logan makes several different models. Um, you can pay anywhere from, you know, $300 up to $1,000 or more. Um, if you're doing it every day, you know, obviously you want to get the more expensive ones. Um, basically what it will do, it, was a, it will cut both a straight cut and a bevel cut. Now you can just use a mat knife and just go around with a ruler and cut the edge out and get a straight cut. Um, I like the beveled cut, particularly if you're doing a double mat, which I'll show you in a second. Now I've cut the, the two sides of this already, so you can see here that this is how it comes. You want to be sure you're using new blades every time. So every time I start a, two new mats, I replace the blades or flip them. And so I've done that already. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this and I've cut two sides. We're going to lay the third and the fourth side down and cut those and show you how. Now this mat cutter, we line the line we drew right up along the edge just a little bit 
from it. And you can actually go down and see if the blade is going to cut right along the line to make sure. This actually has a little red dot and a green dot. The green is where you start and you just start gently. Don't try to go through with the first cut. Just go and do three or four or five cuts until you feel that it's gone through. When you ruin a few mats, you know your blade isn't sharp enough or you've done something wrong. I've done that. And when you're paying $15 or $12 for a sheet of um, archival mat board, then you quickly learn to do it correctly. Okay, so we made another cut. So now we got three sides. Now we're going to do the final side. Once again, use, take your time to line it up and make sure always that your lines are done correctly on the mat board when you draw it. One, two, three. I can feel it going almost all the way through. Underneath, I have another piece of mat board. Why? Because um, it just makes for a clean cut that doesn't drag so that you get little remnants. Now, if I've done this correctly, it should come apart. If it doesn't, that's okay. What I do is just take it and I take it over to the other stand and I cut out the inner piece. I think we're okay. See? Came out perfect. Now, I happen to have, we're going to use this on another picture that I've already cut out and mounted. And, uh, but we can see that it's going to fit perfectly over it, we hope. If it doesn't, then we're going to have to redo it. But there you go. So I will cut off the extra foam core. But next I'd like to go over to the other thing and show you how we put the final picture in a frame and uh, so that we can hang it up. So let's go back over to the drafting table. Okay, so we've cut the mat and it's sized perfectly to the picture. Now this is a different picture that I'm showing you. It is actually a double mat. I wanted you to see what a double mat actually looks like. Now how do I get the mat adhered to the foam core? Well, I use uh, a tape gun uh, made by Scotch right here. It's called an ATG 700 and it has double face tape in it that you can put on the back of the mat to adhere the mat to the picture and to the foam core. Now the next step would be is that we need to put this in a frame. Now as I said, um, you can buy wooden frames or you can buy metal frames. I like the Nielsen metal frames. Uh, they're of good, uh, they've been around forever and they go together easily. You can buy them on the internet or buy them at Michael's or buy them at um, an art store. Um, we'll give you some resources for that. So what we're going to do is put this together into a frame. Um, and so I, I've already put the part of the frame together here. So what I've already done is I've already put together three sides here and I have the fourth side with these pieces that go in. And I did this just for the sake of time. There's not a huge science and guess what? Assembly instructions for Nielsen frames. So you get that along with the uh, frame. And what we're going to do now is just tighten this up so the bottom piece is in there. And I've already put some wire on it so that we can hang it. And then we're ready to hang the picture. Thanks, Sky. That was, uh, that was an awesome demonstration. Um, I hope you guys learned something today. It's a lot of information. We'll probably go over it again. We're going to include some slides of where you can get your materials and the process. You can always contact us here at the show if you want even more information. So today we learned uh, a ton of stuff. We learned uh, about how Sky got started, all the uh, accomplishments he had over at Hingham High School, as well as uh, I, I, other places in media arts. We saw a great demonstration of framing and even given all that, you know there's only two things you really need to know if you want to be a great photographer and that's point and shoot.